good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. I'm Dan Glickman, the director of the Institute of Politics. And I want to welcome everybody here and welcome especially uh, Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr., who has graced us with his presence here tonight. The title of his speech is A More Perfect Union from Civil Rights to Constitutional Rights. And that speech title matches that of the book he wrote two years ago called A More Perfect Union, Advancing New American Rights. In his book, he outlined eight new constitutional amendments that should be benchmarks for the well-being of our society, and I'm sure that he will talk about them. His book and his speech are part of a debate that has gone on since our nation was formed, with the central question being, what is the essential role of government in our society? On the one side, the right, are those that believe the government should do less. On the other, the left, are those that believe the government should do more. President Roosevelt had an opinion about this debate, and this is how he put it. Better the occasional faults of a government that lives in a spirit of charity than the, incon than the consistent omissions of a government frozen in the ice of its own indifference. Our guest tonight, as you will soon realize, is anything but indifferent. He's dedicated his life to educating citizens on the importance of participating in his government. And as those of you know, he comes from a very distinguished American political family. He earned his bachelor's in business management and graduated magna cum laude from North Carolina A&T University in Greensboro, North Carolina, and his master's of arts in theology from Chicago Theological Seminary and his law degree from the University of Illinois College of Law. Prior to his congressional service, he was the national field director of the National Rainbow Coalition. And he was elected to Congress in December of 1995 and is now in his fifth term. He sits on the powerful House Appropriations Committee. His legislative efforts are targeted towards many things, including the ending of the death penalty, curbing the scourge of AIDS, HIV AIDS, and expanding trade in sub-Saharan Africa. One of his key accomplishments is the establishment of the Center of Research on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institutes of Health. But of course, one of his most prestigious items on his resume is that he serves on the Institute of Politics Senior Advisory Committee. You're not my boss, Jesse, I want you to know that. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to have with us this evening the Honorable Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr. Now let me begin by expressing uh, my great appreciation to Secretary Glickman for that uh, very kind and uh, very warm, very generous, uh, very thoughtful, uh, very provocative, very profound, and very truthful introduction. <laughs> I am um, and deeply honored and uh, privileged to have the opportunity of returning uh, to the Kennedy School of Government and to see so many friends who uh, have served with me on the Institute of Politics a senior advisory uh, board. Uh, many years ago, I was asked to serve on uh, that board by uh, my good friend and dearly departed uh, brother, uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, Jr. And um, I'm deeply honored and privileged every time I step in this building uh, to think about uh, him and the opportunities that, and the dreams that we had for this uh, nation uh, that we indeed uh, shared uh, together. Uh, tonight, I want to uh, speak from uh, the subject of a book that I have spent extensive time researching and writing. Uh, the title of my book, A More Perfect Union, Advancing a New American uh, Rights. I uh, find it uh, interesting and uh, indeed uh, fascinating uh, that the two classes that I had the great privilege of talking to uh, today, uh, there was a great interest in reviving uh, the democracy, finding new and creative ways to get people uh, to vote uh, as our democracy gathers new energy and new uh, vitalization from the process of participating in the political process. In the last election, President uh, Bush received about 50 million votes, and Vice President uh, Al Gore received 50.5 million votes. And somehow under the Constitution and the Supreme Court's logic. Uh, the person with the most votes did not become President of the United States. Only in America and our underfunded public education system 
could a loser become the winner and a winner be the loser? But such is the construction of the Constitution of the United States. And so dealing with the depth and the profundity of some of these uh, profound problems uh, is the subject matter for which I have dealt with extensively in my book, A More Perfect Union. The preamble of our Constitution begins, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union with five basic criteria. Number one, to establish justice. Number two, ensure domestic tranquility. Three, to provide for the common defense. Four, to promote the general welfare. And five, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Do ordain and establish the Constitution for the United States. I want to talk briefly tonight about the Constitution, a means towards building a more perfect union. There are two fundamental views of the Constitution. It is viewed as static, narrow, conservative, finished, a strict constructionist document. Or it is viewed as a living document, broad, liberal, unfinished, a broad construction, and obviously I accept the second view. Why is it most important, I argue in a more perfect union, that there are two central issues that have been with our nation since its inception. The issue of who has the power, the federal government or the states. The very inception of our nation, the southern states were making the case that they did not want too much centralized power vested in the idea of a strong central government. After all, the early colonists in our nation had experienced central authority under British rule. And so they made the case that we must have not only a central authority, but the powers of that central authority must run concurrent with the idea of state authority. I argue that from the inception of our nation, this issue of who has the power over people's basic human rights has been a problem at the inception of our nation. Should it be the federal government that has control, or should it, ha should it be the state governments that have control? It is a problem at our inception, and it will be a problem long into our future. I believe this problem is the most central problem that confronts every single American. The second problem that has been with our nation since its inception is the issue of race. I argue in a more perfect union that the issue of race has not been taught to the American people in a way that makes it digestible. It has been taught to the American people in an emotional way and not in an academic way. For if it is taught to the American people in an academic way, it will show us something about the evolution and the development of states' rights and federal power that will be instructive and illustrative for our generation and what we must do to form and build a more perfect union for every American. There are various perspectives from which one can view American history. It can obviously be viewed through the eyes of labor or capital. It's a valid perspective. Whether markets are doing well or not doing well is a factor and an evolution of the history of our nation. Whether or not we will exist as a slave society or a free society, viewing the history of the United States from Wall Street and LaSalle Street is a legitimate perspective. But only the history of African Americans will show you how states are admitted to the Union, one free and one slave between 1820, the Compromise of Missouri, and the Compromises of 1850. Only the history of African Americans will show us how our nation sought at its inception to keep the balance between the federal government and the states. Two states, one free, one slave, to keep the Senate and the House in relative order. One can choose to view the history of the United States from the perspective of women. It is a legitimate and a valid point of view. The struggle from the denial of the right to vote in the Constitution through the movements for suffrage, the struggle for equal pay and for equal work, 
The struggle for an equal rights amendment and against domestic violence is a legitimate and a valid perspective. But the history of women will not show you why 11 states between 1861 and 1865 chose to leave the Union. Only the history of African Americans will show you the great struggle to bring those 11 states back into our Union and why 620,000 Americans lost their lives in that conflict. The history of African Americans is instructive in the great struggle to overcome the limitations of states' rights. One can view American history through the limits and through the lens, if you will, the prism of immigrants. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses who yearn to breathe free. A profound perspective. And immigrants have a legitimate and valid point of view. But only the history of African Americans will show you how we moved from four political parties the Democrats, the Whigs, the Federalists, and after 1854, the Republicans to two political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. You must come through the lens of African American history to see this profound point of view. At the conclusion of the American Civil War in 1865, the question was, what do we do with the nine million freed slaves in the southern states? The Democratic Party of that era made the argument since they had made the case for maintaining slavery in this nation. That the Negro should pick themselves up by their own bootstraps. And that they did not want the federal government or the state government investing in the education, the health care, or the housing of the Negro. 150 years later, when we argued that the federal government should not invest in the education, health care, and housing of all of the American people, today they call that economic conservatism. Conservatism has its roots in the history of the Negro in America. The Republican Party made the case at the conclusion of the Civil War that if we are going to be a government of, for, and by all of the people, that the government has a responsibility, whether it is the federal government or the state government, to ensure that all of its people have education and health care and housing. And whether you're a Democrat or a Republican in 2003 and you find yourselves on one side of the political ledger, the issues of investing in the education, health care, and housing today, we call that liberalism. So the profundity of the race problem in America and its genesis shows us how 250 years later our nation has evolved into a body politic that doesn't refer to itself in racial terms, it simply refers to itself as Democrat, who's liberal on economic issues but more moderate on social issues. It's Republican who is conservative economically but more moderate socially. It's Democrats who are conservative economically and conservative socially. It's Republicans who are moderate economically, but moderate socially. In other words, the nation's race history and race debate defines who the body politic is through history. The most profound moment in American history from my perspective occurred when the southern states demanded that a 10th amendment be added to the Constitution of the United States. That amendment says that those rights not written specifically in the Constitution of the United States are state rights. And therefore, in the last presidential election, it was the 10th amendment, the old slave amendment, since the slave states used the 10th amendment as the basis for justifying the institution of slavery. It was the old 10th Amendment that came to haunt us in, 2000, in the 2000 election. Supreme Court looked at the Constitution of the United States for the word vote, and it first appeared in the 15th Amendment, which said non-discrimination on the basis of race. It then looked for the word vote again, and it occurred in the 19th Amendment, non-discrimination on the basis of sex. It then looked for the word vote again in the 26th Amendment, non-discrimination on the basis of age. And then they looked to the 14th Amendment and somehow construed that a fully punched chad has more protection under the Constitution than a dangling or hanging chad. 
And then they looked to the slave amendment, the 10th amendment that since the right to vote is not affirmatively protected in the Constitution of the United States, the right to vote in America is a state right. And therefore, what does the Florida state statute say? The Florida state statute says that Katherine Harris is in charge of this election. And there are five minutes left to count Al Gore's votes. And if you cannot count them in five minutes, George Bush is going to be the president of the United States of America. The old slave amendment, the 10th amendment to the Constitution came back to haunt our democracy in 2003. Lincoln understood this profound problem in 1863 when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He understood that it was a political document that he was signing, not freeing all the slaves because no president has the capacity to free the slaves by executive order. Because the 10th Amendment still protected slavery within the states. And therefore, the only way over the limitations of the 10th Amendment was specific language in the Constitution outlawing slavery in America, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. It's real simple, therefore. In America, African Americans are free from slavery. Today I stand here as the 91st African American to ever have the privilege of serving in the United States Congress. Number 91 out of 11,700 Americans who've had the privilege of serving on this side of the 13th Amendment. On the other side of the 13th Amendment is a slave society. On this side, I'm in Congress, speaking at Harvard, rejected my application when I sent it, and I serve on the board. <laughs> because the Constitution has the power to divide time and space. It's not that complicated. The word education does not exist in the Constitution of the United States. And therefore, the right to an education in America is a state right. 50 different governors, 3,067 different county education systems, 20,000 different local municipal systems, 53 million kids stuck in a slave education system protected by the 10th Amendment. Why? Because the word vote isn't in the Constitution of the United States. The word education isn't in the Constitution of the United States. The right to an education in America is a state right. In Mississippi, the primary source for educating children in that state comes from that state's sales of catfish and cotton. In Washington state, the primary source of revenue for educating children in that state comes from the Microsoft Corporation five billionaires, including Bill Gates, and tens of hundred millionaires who work at that corporation and the Boeing Corporation. In Washington state, children have laptops in public schools. Because of who they get to tax, in Mississippi, no laptops. Because students at Harvard don't eat enough catfish sandwiches. <laughs> Separate and unequal education in America protected by its constitution. The right to education in America is a state right, just like the right to slavery in America was a state right. And so I've advanced and argued that if we want to rebuild our nation for 100 million Americans who didn't vote for George Bush or Al Gore, for 100 million Americans who wanted to vote, who wanted to participate, but don't believe in our democracy any longer. For 100 million Americans, not the 50.5 who voted for Gore or the 50 million who voted for Bush, but the 100 million Americans who voted for neither. That it is time that we move this democracy forward for every American. Every American deserves the constitutional right to a public education of equal high quality, a 28th Amendment. That's what I'm fighting for, and that's what we're talking about. <laughs> the right to health care in America is not your right. 
The right to health care in America, there's no such language in the Constitution that says health care is your right. Therefore, health care in America is a state right. 50 different governors, 50 different state legislatures, 3,067 different counties, 20 plus thousand different local municipal governments. Separate and unequal. With no commitment from the federal government, and in some cases, no commitment from state governments to ensure that every single American has basic health care. It's time to move our nation from a discussion over medical savings accounts from the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, which argues for universal and comprehensive health care, to whether or not we as Americans believe that the right to health care is a more important right in our country than the right to a gun. I don't know how the right I don't know how the right to a gun got in the Constitution, but in 2003, the right to health care in America is a more important American right than the right to a gun. Perceived in reality, whatever the language, however it has been construed in the Constitution. No fundamental right to health care in America. And 50 different state legislatures cannot get us there. We, the people, the American people, must make the determination whether or not we believe our basic rights, the things we are asking for, should be elevated to fundamental rights for all Americans, or whether or not we are arguing for some special interest group. I did a radio show, Dr. Glickman, the other day with Tavis Smiley and Tom Joyner, and they were asking me the question whether or not Frederick Douglass would have been fighting for affirmative action. I said Frederick Douglass would have supported affirmative action, but he would not be fighting for it. Frederick Douglass lived through the addition of the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. And so in 2003, he would have, have had the high insight of the great progress of our nation, not just for blacks, but for all Americans who are being guaranteed equal protection under the law, at least the struggle to guarantee them equal protection under the law. He would have had the high insight of progress under constitutional amendments versus progress under programs passed by presidents and congresses. Congress's programs are too slow. I say that as a member of Congress. We pass a Leave No Child Behind Act, and then we don't fund it. President Clinton said he was going to fix every school. He didn't do it in eight years. President Bush ain't got no interest in fixing every school. He ain't going to do it in the last year or two he got left. <laughs> But when do our children deserve a good quality education? When Democrats get around to it, when Republicans get around to it, or when the Constitution says it should be provided for them? Equal and high quality. But I don't stop there. I challenge the entire civil rights movement in our nation. We must move beyond fighting for civil rights to fighting for human and constitutional rights for every single American. We must reinvigorate the struggle for equal rights for women who still make 70 cents to the dollar of what men make, and yet they cannot buy bread cheaper, they cannot pay rent cheaper, they cannot go to Harvard cheaper. They deserve an equal rights amendment to that Constitution so they can get equal pay for equal work. It is only fair, but we need a constitutional rights struggle to get women there. It's not that difficult. I said, Dad, I want to fight not for civil rights, but for constitutional rights. Civil rights are important. I'm with, I'm with civil rights. We must defend and protect civil rights, but we must have a broader vision for America than just civil rights. We must boldly, as a nation, walk into a new nation together. I don't know a vehicle that has more power than the Constitution of the United States. Indeed, there are only two events in human history that have the power to divide time. The birth of Christ, from the Christian perspective, B.C. and A.D., 
and the Constitution of the United States. On one side of the 13th Amendment is a slave society. On the other side of the Constitution, I can read. And it's not illegal. On one side of the 19th Amendment, no woman can run or no woman can vote. On this side of the 19th Amendment, there are women in the Senate and Carol Mosley Braun wants to be your president. On one side of the 26th Amendment, 18-year-olds cannot vote. On this side of the 26th Amendment, at least there's opportunity for 18-year-olds to engage the political process. I'm telling you, my friends, on this side of the Constitution is a separate and unequal education system. But on this side, an equal and high-quality education system for every American. Public high school on the north side of Chicago called Nutrier four Olympic-sized swimming pools, 10 tennis courts, a radio station and a TV station at the local public high school. Every teacher has a master's degree, not one class size, more than 15 students. All of the students at New Trier are on their way to Harvard and to Yale and to Dartmouth and to the Ivy Leagues. Students in my congressional district on their way to jail or worse, to Iraq. Every child in America deserves the same high quality public education that students get at New Trier. It should not stop there. Why do state lines keep us from getting a high quality public education? Or health care? Or equality for women? Or a clean, safe, and sustainable environment? Why not walk boldly into a new America for all Americans? And so dad said, son, I'm 60 years old and I believe in civil rights, and I understand what you're saying about constitutional rights, but I think amending the Constitution of the United States is impossible. I said, Dad, it's, it's not impossible. It's been done 27 times. <laughs> he said, son, but it takes too long. One amendment did take 202 years. Another amendment took 10 months. Another amendment took 100 days. So amending the Constitution of the United States is only a factor in our capacity to convince every American that we should. Leadership. Then Dad said, but son, I still think it's impossible. I'm 61 years old. And I said, Dad, but I believe in the impossible. I went to Sunday school every Sunday where I was told to believe in a man who had the capacity with God's help to part the Red Sea. A man who had the capacity to walk on water, to give sight to the blind, to heal the sick, to raise Lazarus from the dead. He himself, a medical impossibility, had been declared dead for three days and on the third day rose from the dead. Dead. Friends, Harvard, IOP, Kennedy School of Government, if we can believe in all of that, then why can't we believe in a new America and build a more perfect union for every single American? Not just the moral right, but the legal right to make the union more perfect for every single American. I hope you will join us in the great struggle to make it so. Thank you and God bless you all. God, I gotta take a breath after that speech. Um, okay, we have now. It's the time for questions uh, from the audience, and um, I would ask, uh, as per usual, that you state your name, where you're affiliated in the school, and try to keep your question very short. We want to try to get everybody in here who can, and so we will start. Um, this gentleman right here, and then there are mics up there as well. So we'll start with you. Um, Orijit Sengupta from the Harvard Business School. Amazing speech, incredible message, completely agree with you. I had a question about affirmative action though. Uh, what do you think of the claim that affirmative action actually sometimes comes at the expense of smaller minorities such as the Asians? Oh, this is a, uh, well first of all, let's put affirmative action in its proper context. 
Affirmative action is a conservative remedy to address 450 years of negative action against African Americans. Dr. King argued that because of this 450 years of negative action, specifically against the Negro, that the nation must make a commitment affirmatively to the Negro. And that affirmative action came in the form of various programs to ensure that given the condition of African Americans, they would have an equal opportunity out of their circumstance. But I think that the debate about affirmative action has been too limited to just progress for the Negro. The reality is affirmative action is equal opportunity. Affirmative action doesn't just apply to African Americans. The primary beneficiary of affirmative action are women in our nation who have been denied equal opportunity at every level of our society. But there wasn't long ago when, in order to be a state trooper in the state of Mississippi, where they only hired white men, in order to be a state trooper, you had to be at least six feet tall, weigh 225 pounds. Well, because of affirmative action laws, which do not allow in the state of Mississippi discrimination against short white men, now a five foot four white man can become a state trooper in Mississippi because of affirmative action. So affirmative action is designed as a program to address fundamental inequity and inequality in our society and come up with affirmative remedies for the discriminated group. Now, albeit, I argue this is a, an, a conservative remedy. But if you heard what I said in my remarks, that if every single American had the right to a public education of equal high quality, affirmative action today would be a lot less necessary uh, because everybody would have a new Trier high school, which means the great disparities that exist in our nation would be one step closer. I'm not saying they would be resolved, but they would be one step closer by giving every single American, all 281 million of them, a legal right to close a profound gap that exists within our system of education on the question of education. Let me go one step uh, further because I think it deserves the appropriate uh, and fair uh, treatment. So if everyone has a public education of equal high quality, then the idea on the question of education of providing any one group with a special benefit on the question of education becomes less necessary. But here on this question, we have had conflicts as African Americans with many of our brothers and sisters who are Jewish in America on the question of whether or not a quota system or a goal target and timetable is the appropriate way of addressing this issue. Given the history of slavery in America, which is different than the history of slavery in any other system, European slavery or Egyptian slavery, as Jewish people and Israelites moved from Israel to the Promised Land, slavery in America is different. Slavery in America requires overcoming the limitations of the dual system, not a single system, a dual system one protected by federal rights and the other protected by state rights. So if that's true then, through the history of Jewish Americans and Jewish people in world Jewry, the idea of a quota has always been seen as a limitation on who and what they can become. That is, only 10 Jewish people allowed in, only 25 Jewish people allowed in. And that is obviously an unfair system given their history. But in the African-American context, the idea of letting 25 blacks into Harvard, we'll take that. <laughs> we'll take 25 blacks in medical school. We'll take it. We see that as a floor. And we can build upon that. Give us 25, plus some more, plus some more. Those African-Americans will eventually work their way back into the black community and help provide basic medical service. We'll take a floor, and then we can build upon it. But don't tell us that the institution itself isn't going to make a commitment to resolving a historic injustice that we can't get in. And not because of our academic qualifications, but because of other factors. And so I think the Wall Street Journal recently wrote an article that showed affirmative action being applied in other ways that are equally as disturbing and, and troubling. So I would argue that um, please view affirmative action as an equal opportunity program given the nation's history. To talk about affirmative action out of the context of that history and we'll have the present discourse. This gentleman right here. Did you, yes. Hi, Congressman. My name is Sam Rosen and I'm a senior core member from the city of Boston. Uh, I was wondering how you see the incorporation of service and the expansion of AmeriCorps and other programs like that uh, incorporating in, into your vision, because at this point, there's, there's not a lot of opportunity for young people to really serve their communities in that capacity. And so how, how do you see service 
How do you see providing opportunities for literally millions of young people after they graduate high school, before they move on to college or even during college, to take a year of their lives to address these problems through uh, volunteer work? Well, I would support some form of national uh, service requirement for all Americans. I think that's reasonable and it's not too much to ask. Uh, but suffice it uh, to say, um, as important as good intentions are, uh, there's nothing quite like a government of, for, and by the people being committed to all of its people making, in some of these areas, service less necessary. If everybody had a public high school of equal high quality, if people in Mississippi had the same high quality education as uh, children in Washington State, there'll be fewer mentors necessary in Mississippi. Uh, but without an e a commitment from the nation to an equal high quality education, not only within a state, in trust state, but interstate, between the states, to move all Americans forward, I I'm not convinced that, um, that uh, uh, um, social service in many of these categories will be seen as anything other than a small commitment in our lives to say we did something at one point in time of our lives, but now we're too busy to renew our commitment to that. Let me show you how this works. The Constitution of the United States is a minimum floor beneath which no American can fall. No state law can fall beneath it, no state action can fall beneath it, and no congressional action can fall beneath it. State laws can be written at the level of the U.S. Constitution. They can even improve upon the U.S. Constitution, but they, never must, they must never be written beneath the U.S. Constitution or they're unconstitutional. Same thing with congressional action. At the level of the Constitution, above, but never beneath. Congress can improve upon the Constitution with laws, but it can never write a law beneath the Constitution because that's unconstitutional. Look at the floor that I set. Let's talk about education because I know a number of volunteers have worked in the schools, for example. The right to a public education of equal high quality takes the existing U.S. Constitution to this level, which means all 50 states must move to this level in their state constitutions. Now every American has a federal remedy for an inferior school, and they also have a state remedy for an inferior school. And because it's a federal right, now the competition that we seek in the public schools doesn't have to occur with a voucher, it occurs between the states. Each state will be trying to make a public education system better than the next state's public education system with increased funding for public education. And by the way, only a fundamental right for a public education of equal high quality can challenge the notion that we as a nation can spend billions of dollars looking for a caveman in Afghanistan, but can't find billions of dollars to provide a decent high quality education for all of our children. We deserve a right to fix that problem. Now, my friends, that is not a democratic right or a Republican right. Rights are nonpartisan have nothing to do with parties, they're not ideological, has nothing to do with liberal and conservative. Rights are inalienable. And I'm arguing that we should be fighting for inalienable rights, even as we volunteer. And we struggle to broaden the volunteer base of our nation. But I might add that um, volunteerism is no substitute for paying teachers well, for paying public servants well, so that they can provide basic services to Americans who've been left behind. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Charles Moore. I'm a junior at the college. I had a question about your uh, notion that there should be equal and high quality education. Uh, the one in enforcement, uh, how would you see enforcing an amendment such as that? And two, how would you see uh, funding an amendment such as that, especially when uh, states have different levels of uh, income? Well, this is an important point. Uh, and I think you have to answer that question by looking at how the present Constitution functions under its structure. First of all, almost no one ever associates a cost associated with the First Amendment, freedom of speech. But from the First Amendment is ABC, NBC, CBS, all kinds of different mediums on radio, television, in various jurisdictions across the country. From the First Amendment is an extraordinary cost associated with freedom of speech. Today, we couldn't even imagine living in a society without it. I'm suggesting to you, my friend, that what are the costs associated with not having a high quality public education for every single American? There's the prison system. There are dietary constraints and concerns for people who are dying of illnesses that if they would just change their diets are associated with not knowing and horrible education. But I would go one step uh, um, further. That over time, such a fundamental right, providing an equal high quality education for every single American, that our nation and its citizenry will become more educated over time under such a fundamental right. And there are certain efficiencies that are associated with that education, including the ability to move between various economies, like an industrial-based economy to an information-based economy. If everyone in 
Their formative high school years had access to computers, had access to wiring. Everyone like Washington State could take home a laptop and were fluent in their ability to function. They would be able to move when the economy changes from one economy to the next economy with certain efficiencies. And therefore, federal and state governments will be paying a lot less for tax consumers because more of the American people will be revenue generators with those efficiencies. Revenue generators pay taxes, deficits go down, debts go down. So their efficiencies that are worked out over time by advancing such fundamental rights. Um, a more perfect union deals with the costs in greater detail. But the question I think we have to raise are what are the costs of not having a high quality education for every child? And I assure you that they are greater. Let's see, I think this lady was next, right up there. Okay, um, thank you, my name is Sophia Lyon, I'm a junior at college. And um, I want to thank you for the speech that you gave, and I really appreciate a lot of the um, issues that you brought up in terms of like equality, ensuring equality for all Americans. But like one thing that I've been concerned with is just the issue of like who is considered an American and the ways in which the Constitution and its amendments apply not only to people who are like citizens already, but people who move into the country or who, um, whether they're legal or illegal immigrants. And so I guess my question is like in, in the na in some, the way in which like the American people have changed because of. Um, a lot of immigration, especially since 1965, and the conception of who is American has changed. How do you um, see your vision incorporating people who might not be of like white or African American, like yeah. or black descent? It's and not the, it's not that uh, not that complicated, but it's a fantastic question. And I would say this: first of all, this is the specific language of one of my amendments. Mm -hmm. All citizens shall enjoy the right to a public education of equal high quality. The very first point to note is that the American people are not going to support a right in their constitution for non-citizens. The American people want a right, and if they amend their constitution, it will be a citizenship right. And I argue that there are certain citizenship rights that are not part of the constitution. Now, how would that apply to non-citizens? Under the 14th Amendment, any person's clause, non-citizens would not have a 28th Amendment right to a public education of equal high quality, but under the 14th Amendment's any person's clause, they would have a 28th Amendment right by way of the 14th Amendment. And that's the way present Supreme Court has extended, and past Supreme Courts have extended additional rights in the Constitution to non-citizens. So if they're non-citizens who are in the United States, clearly they're part of the vision, but politically, Clearly, only a citizenship right is something that has the possibility of passing the Congress and being advanced to the Constitution by the American people. It specifically has to be advanced by the American people on that question. Now, the definition of what it means to be an American. You might pick up Newsweek, you might pick up Time Magazine, and uh, what it means to be an American, they might say it's the browning of America, they might say it's the feminization of America, they might offer the immigrantization of America, they might offer all kinds of different perspectives on what it means to be an American, but my friend, let me tell you, what it means to be an American is what the Constitution says. That's what it means to be an American. And if the Constitution doesn't say it, that ain't what it means to be an American. And towards that end, for example, the Constitution of Article 1, Section 8 says that the Congress shall have the power to declare war, not President Bush. And that's why today I'm in federal court along with 12 other members of Congress suing the President of the United States and Donald Rumsfeld because what he is doing is outside of the Constitution of the United States. Therefore, what he is doing is un-American. He came to the Congress of the United States and said, give us our Iraq resolution. Give us unity so we can go to the UN. And we can tell the UN that because the Congress is unified, uh, we can get the UN to be unified. And then he sold the UN by telling them that if you get unified for peace, we can convince Saddam Hussein to let the inspectors back in. All the while his intention was war. He never meant to use the congressional resolution or the, or the uh, 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 UN resolution to resolve this crisis. His intent was war all the while. And that's why today I'm hoping that whoever that federal judge was in Boston that heard our case would understand the holding on Orlando versus Lard. That because this conflict has not started and Congress has not appropriated any money, that Congress unconstitutionally ceded its power to the President of the United States to declare war when he wants to. And the Constitution does not give him the power to declare war when he wants to. Under Article 1, Section 8, only the Congress can declare war when it wants to. 
And therefore, he needs to come back to Congress and ask us permission on whether or not he should invade Iraq and go door to door in Baghdad. That's my position on that. Um, we, have, we have several questions, and I'm going to try to get them as people stood up. So we're going to do the you and you and you, and then we'll see how we're doing, OK? Because uh, the Congressman has to get back to Washington tonight. So there. Hi, my name is Mike Golden. Uh, I work with City Year in the city, and right now I'd just like to say that these are my personal views and not the views of City Year. But I was curious, I talked with a friend of mine, and we were talking about funding being from property tax for the education system. We said, well, maybe if we, do, if we fix the education system and everyone has an equal right, then it'll be fixed. And after those people get through high school and move on, the, the, um, the discrepancy between the good public schools and the bad public schools will be smaller. But then we also thought, well, maybe this is hiding a bigger problem. And maybe the property tax being so different is the actual problem. And fixing education might be masking it. And I don't make any claims to know everything about this to make an educated uh, statement about it. But I'd like to hear your opinion on whether that would be some, I mean, really just your opinion on the discrepancy in property tax. And uh, obviously that's property tax, thanks Michael for your question. Obviously property taxes are a problem. They're a problem, for example, in the case like Bel Air. Bel Air pays much higher property taxes uh, and therefore they have fantastic public schools. Or in Evanston Township, they just issued uh, a bond uh, in Evanston for a new public high school, $80 million for a public high school. But on the south side of Chicago, we haven't had a bond referendum and can't afford to build a new public high school in maybe 50, 60 years. So property taxes is a factor in this. But the reality is uh, there's some crooked ways out here that need to, be, need to be made straight. The premise is wrong. Let's say we fix public education in the state of Massachusetts. Well, great. We can spend a whole lifetime trying to do that. Then there are 49 other states to do. And by the time we finish the other 49 states, you're dead and gone. The same person who has the same drive in other states may not have the same drive to fix public education that you have in your state. And therefore, what a fundamental right does is it empowers each parent who has a child in the public school to help us move the nation in that direction, in equal high quality education. One Supreme Court in each generation will interpret what high quality means based upon the facts of the case that's before it. In this generation, an equal high quality education for 53 million kids in public schools might mean every child in America is entitled to a laptop. A court will have to make that determination. If one group has it, another group has it, that will have to go all the way up to the Supreme Court and let them determine what high quality means in this generation. In the last generation, equal high quality, this wasn't about, the struggle wasn't about integrating schools between blacks and whites. That's a very liberal interpretation of American history, but it's not a human rights interpretation of American history. The goal was not to integrate schools. The problem was that local state legislatures were funding the white public high schools and white schools and had inferior schools in the black neighborhoods. And so we began busing people from the inferior schools to where the state legislature had been spending the money. But if everyone had the right to a public education of equal high quality, and the white schools were like the black schools, and the black schools were constantly improving at the same level that the white schools, busing would be less necessary. But the problem is the right to an education in America is a Therefore, you have 50 different governors, 50 different approaches, and great disparities that exist within the states, let alone between the states, on the question. And that's why in these presidential campaigns, we must demand a higher expectation of these candidates stop fighting for little bitty programs, but fight for new rights so that we, as Martin Luther King Jr. Can said, we can speed up the day where Jews and Gentiles and blacks and whites and Protestants and Catholics can hold hands and walk across the same stage together because we all got internet training. We all had access to laptops. We all had swimming pools. We all had martial arts instruction. We all learned about the history of women. We all learned about the history of African Americans and Native Americans and Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans and the process for immigration because at every public high school, everyone got an equal, I didn't say equal, equal high quality. Equal means take something from Nutria and move it over here. No, I said, if you're inferior, you deserve the right to be like Nutria. So each generation will determine what that is. And we will move forward together as a nation. 
Only the Constitution has that power, my friends. Okay, this lady and this gentleman, and we're going to have to call it a day. From there. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Lisa Willis. I'm from Harvard Law School. Mr. Jackson, I was wondering, you referenced the inequitable funding schemes that we currently have in education. Under your proposed amendment, how would you rectify these funding schemes specifically? What type of mechanisms do you think would ensure that all children receive equal, high-quality education? And my second quick question is, as a teacher... One question. No, it's really quick. As Real a teacher, quick. it seems like... Public education is working. It's working for certain groups of people. It's working for white, middle class, and upper class children. Under your proposed amendment, how would you ensure that all children receive the quality of education yeah. in spite of the racism that exists? Today? Yeah, the second part of the amendment says, and the Congress of the United States shall have the power to implement the article by appropriate legislation. In other words, the second part of the amendment addresses the state's rights question. Uh, that is, uh, on the same day that blacks in ghettos and Hispanics in barrios and poor whites in trailer parks uh, get a high quality public education, they will all get it on the same day. So only the Congress has the power to ensure that there are enough teachers with master's degrees. Fifty different legislatures can't prioritize it that way. Only the Congress has to look out over the scope of the nation, look at the deficit of teachers, and make that adjustment. Only Congress, with the help of the states, can appropriate the money to make the schools themselves, in terms of physical construction, the exact same and even higher and even improve upon it over time. Let me try and say it this way. Every single bill that was advanced during the Civil Rights Movement, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the public accommodations legislation from 66 through 68, all of them had their emphasis on fulfillment of the second clause of the 14th Amendment. And the Congress shall have the power to implement the provisions of the 14th Amendment. What I am suggesting to you is that there cannot even be another civil rights movement to improve the schools unless the right to an education of equal high quality is added to the Constitution. <laughs> and then one of you will emerge fighting for the legislation as a civil right to ensure everyone has a, t a teacher with a PhD. Then one of you will emerge de arguing and demanding that every class size be reduced or increased as a federal piece of legislation. Then someone will emerge, some Rosa Parks will emerge arguing that this is an inferior school but under the 28th Amendment the Congress should have fixed this thing and then take them to court to fix this thing. Only in that context can the next movements begin but they require specific language in the Constitution of the United States to get there. I did miss your second question, but let me address it after the program. Thank you. Last question. My name is Ryan Downer. I'm a junior at the college. I think the education amendment is a great idea, but ideas are only so valuable insofar as there's action behind them. So my question is, how will you mobilize your colleagues in Congress? And more specifically, how is the Washington State Legislature what is their incentive to improve Mississippi schools? So how are you going to mobilize to get this done? Well, let me thank you for your question. The first thing is everyone should have received the document that I passed out tonight uh, where you have to answer some basic questions, including give me your name, address, and phone number if you believe that certain basic rights should be part of the Constitution of the United States. Contacting Senator Kennedy and Senator Kerry from this state uh, and several other congressmen in the state and encouraging them to sign on to legislation uh, that will advance these new fundamental rights, particularly since one of them wants to be president of the United States, uh, becomes an important part of that process. That's where some of your civic engagement as a student can be helpful in the process. Believe me, they'll be coming to Harvard, seeking your support, making great speeches, bringing a lot of cameras with them to prove they can get liberals to stand up on their feet and clap. But I'm telling you, if you want to get 100 million people engaged in the process, they need to fight for something more than a program. They need to fight for a fundamental right and overcome some legal hurdles that exist in our system so that every child can have uh, that basic uh, fundamental opportunity. And the second part of your question was? Basically, state, more specifically, like state legislatures, such as? Yeah, this is how this works. Um, the only reason that Washington schools at this level are better than Mississippi schools is that there's a high-tech economy that exists in Washington. Right. Some future economy may not engage a high-tech economy, and that might find itself in another state. And at that point in time, Washington state might find itself lagging woefully behind some other state where the revenue has now moved to. 
including if the, suddenly the whole country woke up and decided that every day they have to have catfish for breakfast, catfish for lunch, and catfish for dinner. Then education is going to move, high quality education because of catfish, is going to move to Mississippi. That's the role of the federal government to look at the states and the great disparities that exist between the states and to be able to write legislation specifically that allows other states to catch up with states that have high-tech economies or catfish economies or whatever economy is the desirable economy at that time within the state. That is the role of the federal government. But the federal government cannot even actualize or advance that role without a specific instruction from the American people in its constitution. Because as soon as you go to Congress today and say that every child in America does deserves an equal high quality education, the first thing every member of Congress is going to tell you that in America, the right to an education is a state right. And it's not even the role or the responsibility of Congress to resolve this profound problem. It is a state issue. So get out of Congress. Don't come to Washington. Go see your governor. And that is the separate and unequal system. That is what made American slavery so much different than any other form of slavery, in that overcoming the limitations of the system is the key not just for black Americans, but for poor Americans. And let me say it this way, because I feel Secretary Glickman on my heels. No, no, I'm on your shoulder. On my shoulder. <laughs> the same constitutional amendment that wipes out inferior housing in a ghetto is the same constitutional right that's going to wipe out inferior housing in a barrio. And it's the same constitutional right that for the first time in the history of the nation is going to wipe out trailer park living for working class and poor whites in America. And it sounds something like this. All citizens and non-citizens will have access to the right by virtue of the any person's clause of the 14th Amendment. All citizens shall enjoy the right to decent, safe, and affordable housing. And the Congress of the United States shall have the power to implement this article by appropriate legislation. Without such a fundamental right in America, a decent, safe, and affordable housing right in America, the right to decent, safe, and affordable housing in America is a... Therefore, you end up with 50 different state housing systems, 3,067 different county housing systems, and 20,000 different mayors trying to do the best they can to provide decent, safe, and affordable housing, and very little, if any, congressional commitment to move the whole nation towards decent, safe, and affordable housing. And that requires, my friends, not a struggle for civil rights, but a struggle for new constitutional rights deeply rooted in the tradition of struggle and change in our nation. The same energy that you're spending fighting for universal health care is the same energy that you could be fighting for the right to health care of equal high quality. The same energy that some of you are fighting for a clean environment, you should be fighting for the I was born with the right to breathe. I don't have a state right to breathe a Massachusetts right to breathe. I have a human right to breathe. But a human right is only codified in the Constitution. If it ain't there, you have a state right to breathe. Now, uh, th this is an important point uh, for politics, and I'll, I'll end because I understand that my time is, uh, has drawn to an end. Um, and that is this. There is no program that any Democrat running for president right now can offer that can re-engage 100 million Americans who voted for neither in 2000 back in the process. But what program can we advance that has the opportunity to get the attention of 100 million Americans who did not vote for anyone? What program can we advance that would force 50 governors in this country to go on record, either for you or against you? What program would force 435 members of Congress to go on record and 100 senators to go on record? What program would force the President of the United States to take a position on record is bigger than fighting for a right? And what program could encompass moving millions of Americans into a new era? I argue that only fundamental rights and the struggle for fundamental rights can get us there as a nation. I hope you all will join us in the great struggle to make the union more perfect. Before you leave, I just want to say one thing before you give him a hand. This man is from Chicago, which is a great city. And we were talking before, there was a great architect in Chicago named Daniel Burnham, 
who basically, uh, if you notice, Chicago has some of the greatest architecture in the world there. And he once said, make no little plans, for they do not have the power to stir men's souls. And I think what you're hearing tonight, and one of the important reasons why we had this forum is because this man brought some big plans for us to listen to. So let's give a big thank you to Jeff. <laughs> Thanks.